It is the story of romance and salesmanship and opportunity. It is the story of profit in paradise, but it needs and must have your support. We hope you will be with us as we tackle our fantastic future. As its urbanization benefited the citizens of Hawaii as a whole, and the Native Hawaiians in particular, let's take a look. The land was unpolluted, and the people were self-sufficient. Only 25 years later, such persons as we seek desire to find attractive and charming residential districts, free from all objectionable features and neighbors. The decrease in population was primarily the result of the introduction of disease from early European explorers. The native Hawaiians had no immunity, and the result was mass death of genocidal proportions. The native population collapsed. Waikiki's well-tended taro and fish ponds, tenderly nurtured by Hawaiian labor, would soon become a distant memory. By the late 1800s, native Hawaiians, seeing their nation increasingly under the influence of Western businessmen, petitioned Queen Liliuokalani for a new constitution to restore more power to the Hawaiian monarchy. Men like B.F. Dillingham, William Owen Smith, and other sugar planters, merchants, and lawyers were part of an oligarchy opposing the Hawaiian monarchy and plotting its overthrow. On January 17, 1893, armed gangs of businessmen, supported by U.S. Marines, illegally overthrew the Kingdom of Hawaii. Sanford Dole was appointed president of the provisional government. The years 1893 to 1898 may be accurately characterized as a period of dictatorship in Hawaii. The Constitution of the Dole Republic was intentionally modeled after Mississippi's Constitution, a southern slave state noted for disenfranchising black voters. The Western oligarchy was in the position to pass a series of laws advancing their own self-interests. Modeled after the U.S. slave state of Louisiana's penal code, the Hawaiian penal code contained a variety of laws designed to put native Hawaiians at a distinct disadvantage. For example, the new vagrancy laws allowed landless native Hawaiians to be rounded up and forced to work as slave labor on the sugar plantations. If fines were not paid immediately, it meant hard labor in prison or the seizure of property. If more than three people gathered, it could be declared a riot. By the late 1800s, Westerners, though only 9% of the population, owned 67% of the taxable land. Native Hawaiian lands were turned into a commodity to be bought by those with money and lost by those without. The land would be used primarily for a single commercial crop for export, sugar. Westerners dispossessed Native Hawaiians from their lands through the enactment and enforcement of Western influence laws and the subsequent manipulation of the legal system. In 1848, one of these laws, the Great Maheli, formulated by a Western attorney named William Lee, was supposedly intended to distribute land equitably. The Maheli may have been great for Western business interests, but it proved to be a disaster for the 70% of the Native Hawaiians who lost their land. It's very simple. A corporation is in business for one thing only, and that's to make a profit. If we get fuzzy in our thinking about that, we're in serious trouble. Hawaiian paradise is a business, the business, the business, the business, the business, the business, the business.